Coming off shift at Snowdown Colliery, Kent, are John Moffat, a fitter, and Stanley Foster, secretary of the Colliery Welfare Football Club. Before the war, John Moffat was a professional footballer. A minor today, he still finds time to train the first team at the colliery. Under Moffat's watchful eye, the Snowdown Club has done pretty well for itself. Last year, one of their men was transferred to Coventry City, and the first team ranked high in the Kent League. The club manager spent 17 years with Coventry, and now he's running one of the most progressive sides in minors football. John Moffat puts a lot of emphasis on ball control in his training. The football season may be nearly over, but the boys of Snowdown, with John Moffat at the helm, will be hard at it through the summer in search of bigger and better honours next season. There'll always be a need for men who can use a shovel in the mines, but mechanisation at the coalface has been making giant strides in British pits. Of the machines which can not only cut coal but load it as well, we have seen quite a number in past issues of Mining Review. You may remember them by their distinctive name, the Mito Moore, the Waffler, the Anderton Sierra Loader, the Dosco Miner. Now at Treswell Colliery, another successful cutter loader is operating, the Gloucester Getter. The getter literally cuts out blocks of coal with its two vertical and three horizontal cutting jibs. She's being set up at the start of her cut and a chute which will feed the coal from behind the getter onto the conveyor alongside is being manhandled into place. At three or four feet a minute, the five jibs on the machine bite deeply into the coal tape. Now the large slabs start coming off. The ports are taken down in front of her as she moves along the face and temporary props are set immediately behind the machine to support the newly exposed roof. As the glass together moves past, the conveyor is snaked over behind it. With the getter, there's no need to turn the machine round when it reaches the end of the 150-yard tape. All that's necessary is to reverse the shearing jibs and the coal chute, and it can cut its way straight back. In the East Midlands, there are already 17 glass getters at five different collieries a useful addition to the army of cutter-loader machines battling for higher output in the pit. Always on call in Britain's coal fields are the men of the Mines Rescue Service, ready to face the enemy who always strikes the first swift blow. Fire, explosion, the call to save men from high concentrations of black damp and fire damp, the recovery of sealed off areas. They're all part of a tough job any day or night of the week. To help the Mines Rescue Committee give fresh advice for carrying out rescue operations where it's hot and moist underground, the Coal Board in 1953 gave the go-ahead for a series of experiments using Mines Rescue Men to find out human reactions when working in sheer heat and humidity. Part of the research has been carried out at Oxford at the university's Department of Human Anatomy, a team of Oxford and Coal Board scientists worked out tests to be carried out on mine rescue men. One of the tests is to find out how much the human body can stand under the worst than tropical conditions in which rescues must often be carried out. Here, a rescue man steps up and down to the beat of a metronome while the air he breathes out is kept for analysis and measurements of his blood flow and pressure are recorded. Cooperating with Oxford in the experiments 
is the Doncaster and District Mines Rescue Station. Here at Doncaster is a specially built hot chamber kept at 120 degrees Fahrenheit and 100% humidity. 43-year-old Ernest Flower, a deputy from Steepley Pit, is one of the volunteer guinea pigs. Before going through the test, Flower is weighed. In an hour's time, he'll have lost two pounds. All volunteers get a medical checkup before going into the heat. Different types of breathing gear are used in the test. The aerophore, seen here, uses liquid air. The proto, which Ernest Flower is wearing, needs compressed oxygen. There's still another check before Flower enters the hot chamber. His skin temperatures are recorded under normal conditions. The wires on his back will be connected up from time to time to give readings once he's inside. In here, Flower might have left England and be in the tropics. But for him, there's no sitting about for long. There's work to be done. Before he starts, temperature readings are taken. During the first half hour of the test, Flower walks to the beat of a metronome at a steady two miles an hour with a 50-pound sandbag on his shoulder. temperature and humidity inside the chamber, and every four minutes, Flower takes a one-minute rest period, while his temperature readings are studied and recorded outside the chamber. At half-time, there's a five-minute rest. Then Flower starts hunting 24 50-pound sandbags from one end of the hot chamber to the other. One thing the tests have shown is that men between 31 and 45 can take it just as well as those in the 19 to 31 age group. The results of these tests is an information bulletin setting out the findings so that rescue team leaders all over the country and incidentally overseas will know better than ever before just how much their men can stand and what they can safely ask them to do in their fight against an enemy who always strikes the first blow but not, if they can help it, the last. <laughs> <laughs>